Reporting live from Disneyland in California, this is John Robinette. And Linda Sue. And this is World, World Attraction News. Good morning, John. Good morning, Linda. How are you doing? Nice Good. to be at Disneyland today. Sure isn't is. It? Isn't it great weather outside? <laughs> we have a very interesting segment planned for our audience today. We want to welcome everyone here in our, our live studio audience. Um, to kick us off, can you just share with us some of the trends that, that you talked about last year on our report? Sure. Last year, we thought we'd review, we went through the global growth of resident markets, and particularly the middle class, and how that's going to expand rapidly in the future, particularly in Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa, which you can see up on the screen here. Let's go to the next slide, the 2050 slide. There you can see the, how, how it expands, particularly in China, but also the Middle East, Asia, and Africa. The middle class is growing, and the middle class is what fuels our industry. Very interesting. What, what's new this year? Well, this year the long-term trends haven't changed much, uh, but in the short term, we, we have some predictions about the, the global economy, which we, we want to talk about. Uh, as you can see in this slide, the darker you get, the faster your economy is growing. If you're dark blue, you're over 5% GDP growth per year. So you can see Asia is still growing rapidly, particularly China and India. And North America is growing fairly strongly. Europe is just starting to turn around. There's some light at the end of the tunnel there. So there, there is some growth, but overall, the prediction for short-term growth is rather modest. So uh, we need to act accordingly to that in the short term. Now, I think one thing we want to look at, too, is the tourist markets. They've grown remarkably. And if we look at the uh, next slide here, you can see, is that 2010, Linda? Yeah, 2010, the tourist market, with Europe, of course, being the cradle of Western tourism. But as we go to 2050, you can see that Asia uh, grows tremendously again. And if we look at national tourism or domestic tourism, this is for China. Of course, China has these crazy numbers. You can see billions of domestic tourists in China. So the tourist markets are growing rapidly. The red middle class is growing. So the, the long-term future looks, looks pretty good. And our, our attractions need to keep their eyes on the ball when it comes to tourists and how to develop products for, for tourists on the national level. Okay. Did you want to talk about China? Well, China, well, Chris will talk about China in a bit. But uh, Chinese markets are still growing. I mean. Everyone complains that China is predicting 7% growth. Well, we would love to have 7% growth here. So it's it's still strong growth. Chris, Chris can talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but the tourists, as I mentioned, are, are growing rapidly. And, and that's something, uh, as well as the residents, that, that produce a lot of demand for our products. Well, that's a lot of numbers and macroeconomics. But, but really, how does all that apply to our audience here today? Well, I, I think for the short term, if we speak to that, that we have to make hay when the sun shines. We're all very busy, at least at least we are, in our upstream consulting work. There's a lot of projects being planned by now. But in the midterm, the predictions are for rather modest growth globally. And what the operators tend to do when the, when the economic growth settles down a bit is focus on their existing attractions and renovating them and providing reinvestment for the new rides, shows, exhibits that they need to have, and, and, and general reason. I think industry needs to keep an eye on our existing attractions because that can provide a lot of business for us to be having live in existing parks. So when the economy settles a bit, I think that might be Great. Thank you, John. Um, you know, what I'd really like to do now move on um, to talk about a little bit of our theme index. Um, and, you know, it's underway this spring. And we're very fortunate today to have Chris Yoshi here. Uh, he's the director of AECOM's Leisure and Culture Practice in Asia. Um, and he went into class at 2 a.m. just in time. <laughs> just for you. So, uh, you know, Chris, can you talk about the trends that you're seeing in Asia? Uh, sure, that's right. Uh, well, Asia is, is really undergoing a phenomenal boom period right now in the attractions industry. Uh, for, for this last year, it's been a, a very steady growth. Uh, the two main drivers, as you can imagine, is uh, expansions or major expansions of the kind, such as Universal and uh, Open Harry Potter, and their attendance counting over 20%, uh, which is 
already a big number, and it's just, it's just been just a really big number. Uh, and also new parks. So we have, we have the opening of uh, a major park in China, which is called the Blue Highlands. It's a developer in uh, They won the, the key award winner award winner this year. Uh, but their park opened in the first year in 11 months. They had over 500 and, and what's interesting about that park is their price was 40% above any other park. So it wasn't really uh, the price was going to be too, just they had a very good quality park, a very good market, and were able to deliver it. The, uh, <clears throat> the other, looking just more closely in China, uh, China, of course, is the big story uh, in Asia. Um, and we've been doing our research and for updating our Bing index and also we, we do a report called the Plasma Report. And our, our staff are having trouble trying to keep track of all the new projects going on. And, and it's getting, you know, they're, they're complaining about how much this is going to um, Last year alone in China, there was 25 new projects open. So theme parks and water parks or, or indoor entertainment. 15 water parks. Which, and a lot of them, you know, we had no idea they were even in the works, and, and then they opened. And that that seems like a phenomenal number, but we also, I also like to think about it in perspective. Because we're in China, you have almost 200 cities with a million population. You know? So, and if you think in the U.S. or Canada or, or Europe, every metro area with a million population, a lot of them have some sort of a park. Park, or in some cases, more than that. So, in China, you know, adding 25 projects in one year seems like a lot, but when you've got 200 cities that many of them don't have much at all, uh, we're going to see things enormous growth for a long time. Um, Can you talk a little bit more about American cities? And I think traditionally we thought about cities more in coastal areas or major metropolitan areas. I'd like to say I knew where they all were, but I actually don't know <laughs> all the names. Uh, but but it, they're they're happening all over, and it's happening uh, in particularly moving uh, Western Western cities. So more of the inland cities uh, are developing quite rapidly, uh, and it's not the big cities anymore. It's really third and fourth year cities. But but when in China we talk about first year cities, and those that's Beijing. Uh, second tier cities, uh, third tier cities, fourth tier cities. The fourth, fourth tier cities are still you know, well over a million people. Um, and you know, they may be growing quite rapidly. And as John has alluded to, it's really the middle class is booming in these parts of the world. So that's what's really driving the So you're seeing income rise even in the third and fourth tier cities? Yeah, it's, it's actually rising faster in those. Yeah, I think there's there's a um, there's just a very wide variety of uh, things that are going on. Um, there's a lot of experimentation with different formats and, and sizes, and, uh, including um, indoor parks. There's a wide range of things that are going indoor, and, and some are modest scale, some are enormous. These, these indoor things, uh, centers are tied in with shopping centers. There's a, a several hundred new shopping centers opening every year. And it used to be that if you had a new shopping center, you know, it was a new thing and everyone would go and it would be successful. But, well, now a lot of cities have more than one or several, and, and they're having to compete. They're having to compete with customers. They're having to compete with families. So we are seeing um, a lot of developers are looking for indoor entertainment, um, and, and you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity there for those who are good at indoor entertainment, particularly media-based things that can be updated and refreshed uh, over there. So we do uh, uh, indoor is, is really an uh, area that that has, isn't really done very much. Can you talk more specifically about some of these attraction sites and some of the, the types? And I 
made of the brain is a nightmare for us. We're playing not walking. <laughs> Can you talk more about that? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they do range, uh, you know, some, some projects that are both uh, educational oriented and some are machine oriented. Uh, it's really just a, a wide range. Um, they, they, they try to market, they really like shows. So they're doing a lot of big production shows, very large shows, you know, 1,000, 2,000 seat theaters, which is extravagant. So I think there's a, um, there's really a, And it's, it's very cutting edge. It's very creative and very interesting. You're saying we should be looking to Asia for some of the hottest things in terms of technology. Well, I, I, I think a lot of them are using the people who are I think that most of the people in Asia have something going on. It's really affiliated. They are bringing in. But they're also, you know, developing their own, um, their own uh, attitude and their own style. And, and so it's going to be a mix. And what about IP? Can you talk about that in the Asian context? Well, there's a um, there's a big interest in, in international IP, meaning, you know, the, obviously the Disney and Universal uh, under right now. Uh, that has spurred a lot of interest. Cities and developers, they, they also want to have their, their international um, and, and partially it's, it's stimulated by um, developers who look to have, if they can get an international IP park, they, that would help them negotiate a better deal with local government for, for land use land. So, um, on the other hand, the cities are looking for uh, new areas of growth, and, and theme parks are actually considered a very positive uh, economic development tool because it's cultural. It's considered a cultural asset and cultural investment. There's a lot of um, um, kind of built up very quickly in, in the industry and manufacturing, and they've, they've been turned away from that for services, uh, where they, and also domestic consumption, and so there's, there's a lot of Actually, support from the very, very high level of government for cultural, uh, cultural industry. Uh, and so, theme parks are considered a cultural industry, even if it's Mickey Mouse, it's still a cultural industry. So, so there's a lot of interest in it. Um, and the advantages for having an IP is when you talk to our various partners involved, is it, it, they do generate more attendance, they do generate a higher revenue. Uh, and they get a, a greater marketing exposure right away. You're creating a new destination or a new part of the city, which can be a great thing for a very populous area. Uh, but also, it's really important for government approval. And that's a, uh, it's important in a society or an economy where the government controls so much of everything. Uh, getting that government approval is really important. But, uh, so I, I probably hear a hundred times a year people saying they want these parts, but the challenge is that they don't really understand. I think a lot of the people here do understand. Um, there, there, there are challenges. It's not just licensing and contractual issues that cause that. But they're just really complicated to implement. And that's where we're seeing a lot of problems in, in Asia where they may have the intention and the money and the land, but how do you actually implement it without having a, a, an engineer and without having the resources to do it? So it's really been a challenge, I think, for uh, people of how do you implement it. Uh, so I, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity for program managers, project managers, and things like this. And it's just a, you know, they're starting from a very low level of understanding of, of what it takes and how to do things. So, so you, it's theme park 1A every day. Chris, <laughs> you know, for many years we've talked about the one child policy in China and the fact that you know, there's a huge importance placed on these children 
that people have, and, and you know, a lot of products are created for them. Um, you know, I had a niece recently who was talking about Hello Kitty and, and loving Hello Kitty. What, what can you tell us about the children's attraction? Well, they, uh, they did open the Hello Kitty. A uh, new park just opened up in uh, But there is a, um, because of the, the emphasis on what I'll call it the, the growing wealth of people willing to spend quite a lot of money to entertain and educate their children. The children can really, you know, they say they want to go somewhere and do something. So, so we're the, I, I'm based in Hong Kong, and you know, we see so many more families coming over to Hong Kong than we could ever do, uh, just because their the kids are bringing their, their families to the nursery park, to the um, and the skills driving. So we're seeing a big uh, interest in you know, children's oriented attractions, and. I think that's a niche market that, that has a lot of uh, upside for the children, particularly if it can be educational, engaging, uh, but also in place and connected. So the, the children market, I think, is, even though there's a big need for that, because the one child does not have to move children to the other city, uh, it's still a, a bidding point. So you're there from the ground zero, day in, day out, going to theme park one day and everything. What, what advice can you give people about working in China and Beijing? And what are some of the opportunities and some of the challenges? I think the opportunities are um, okay, so there is just a large number of projects coming in. Um, and that's the number of phone calls and queries and drives as well. Um, the challenges is really. From a, from a business perspective and from a CEO and from an individual organization, uh, it's just you know getting these things to my staff that are really those are real those are real challenges and, and <laughs> kind of and, and, and the the understanding of what a contract means is, is a little bit different. So you you do wind up having to. Even after you know, getting the contract started and going, is, is really paying attention to see how the, the project is moving ahead and how it's going uh, and be doing a good job. So, so on the one hand, you know it's important to jump in and get moving, but you also have to be from a business perspective cautious that you know, they don't always follow the contract. So it's a in some case, some countries, it's, it's worse than others. In China, it's a, a vacuum filler that kind of fills all the gaps. It just pours. In, in India, it's always once a contract is signed, then the negotiations start for how to you know, carry out the contract. So, um, but uh, I think the other uh, challenge is, is just, um, I think, in, in here in, in the U.S., you know, we're all used to dealing with very professional. People in a group environment and people that understand schedules, that understand you know, what everyone does and how to work together. And in Asia, you'll find that the schedules are just completely off. Everything needs to be done very, very fast. Uh, and, and, not, and the people you're, you may be teaming up with are an architect and you're a subcontractor. So, you know, it, it's a little, it's definitely. Wild West in that environment, but, uh, but if you can you know, just keep with it and keep going, it, it's it's an exciting place to be. And the, the amount of creativity and unique things that are happening there is just really fun. Fun place to be. It's just it's just fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for that update, Chris, and we really appreciate you flying in um, for this. Um, we're looking forward to seeing what your Asian team pulls together for the Green okay. Index this year. Uh, why don't we move on to Europe, uh, Middle East, and Africa? Um, our, our correspondent um, in London, Marguerite, actually was called away in the last minute to Turkey. Um, but I know that John, you've been doing some investigative reporting with her. So, you know, can you talk a little bit about what's happening in Turkey? Yeah, 
sure. We, we got a report from Marguerite, uh, who's in our London office and oversees this industry in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And uh, she reports that in Europe, uh, there's, there's good news, finally. I mean, Europe's been in the doldrums for a long time, as we all know. But last year, the parks started, in Northern Europe, started picking up a bit. And she says this year, what we're seeing from our initial team in Kinvex is also now Southern European parks are, are starting to, to pick up in their attendance, which is good news. Um, Marguerite also says that the theme parks are now being considered more by the government as, as good development uh, options. And private developers are looking into them. So the, the overall mood in Europe is, is, is turning right now. So it's, it's a good point to start. I, I know many of us in this room may have not focused on Europe for a long time because of, of Asia and, and a fairly good industry here in, in Latin America. Uh, but now might be the time to take a look at Europe as you know, it's, it's on the cusp of, of, of turning around. I think uh, in terms of the Middle East, you know, we all know there's a lot of projects to talk about there, and there's always a big pipeline. Uh, you know, and there's little drops that fall out of the end of the pipeline when, when something gets might get built. Um, but th there are some uh, some big projects now underway in the Warner Project and, and others. So it should be open soon, within a year or two. So it'll be interesting to see how those how those perform. You may have noticed in the in index we don't we don't we have water parks but not theme parks yet because we don't quite meet the threshold. In terms of attendance, but but one thing the Middle East is doing is is pushing the envelope on the, the indoor attractions, family entertainment centers, and so forth associated with retail development. So we're seeing a lot of action in that area. We don't track that specifically in the Green Index, but we've got a, we're doing a lot of studies for these, and and that's a, a segment of the market in the Middle East that's pretty strong because of the weather and because of strong retail demand, frankly, and the historic undersupply of contemporary retail. So, so that's uh, that's an area that's, that's doing well. Um, Russia, we were all going to Moscow last year and the year before, but now we're not going so much. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the political and economic situation in Russia is, is not great right now, and some of the projects are going to take longer to get out of the ground, and some are on hold. And the Russian economy is probably going to slip into recession if it isn't already. So. I think Russia is not quite as rosy as maybe we all thought it was. In fact, some of the other BRICS, you know, Brazil is probably on the verge of recession right now. Russians on the verge of recession. India and China is still doing well, but I think you can forget about that BRIC acronym for a while. Uh, yeah. Can you give us a sense, you know, from the themed index work about where the industry is heading? Well, yeah, I think I think uh, in Europe we're seeing positive results. I think the top five theme parks and Europe, according to Marguerite, are going to switch around this year because some have some have really gone up and some haven't. So we're going to we're going to see a, a different lineup there this year. But overall, I'd say these markets are are, are turning around and looking like they'll have modest growth in the near future. John, that was very interesting. We've got about two thirds of the globe covered right now. Why don't we move on to our very very own Brian Sand, who flew in from Washington D.C. Yesterday, we have in our studio to talk about the Americas. Um, you know, Brian, I, I want you to talk a little bit about what we're seeing here, but since we're right here at the Disneyland Hotel, why don't you start with market leaders? Sure. Thanks very much, Linda. Uh, I'd like to, I'm glad to report that Disney's performance in 2014 was outstanding, achieving the fourth consecutive year of record company wide performance. And that performance extends to the parks and resorts business segment. Uh, as many of you probably know, revenue was up 7% last year. Operating income was up 20% in that segment. And interestingly, the domestic parks performed much more strongly than the, interna than the international parks. Driving these increases was uh, higher per capita spending as well as higher attendance. And such strong domestic performance has benefited greatly from the good U.S. economic situation. I'm going to talk a lot about that here, but we are, although it maybe doesn't always feel like it, we are actually uh, doing pretty well economically in the U.S. Uh, in comparison to a lot of parts of the world. That drove record-breaking attendance uh, tourism numbers, excuse me, in Orlando, in Los Angeles, New York, uh, Las Vegas, other major markets. And uh, Disney obviously benefited from that, as did the other major operators in the U.S. But of course, stronger attendance, higher per capita, requires more than just uh, a strong economy. It requires new attractions, improvements in visitor experience as well. 
and increases in Disney spending. You can see some of those uh, that occurred this year at Disney uh, behind me here. Ryan, what about the future for Disney? What, what's coming up? Yeah, well, looking forward, Disney has a lot going on, as you all know. Um, getting most of the attention at the moment is the mega hit Frozen. Uh, which offers tremendous opportunities both now and in the future for leveraging the associated IP. Uh, the major IPs and development uh, at Disney as well are Avatar and Star Wars. Uh, in addition to these investments in new attractions, Disney is also improving and expanding its resorts and retail dining components. Also, uh, Bob Iger noted this week that there are plans in the works to uh, do a significant expansion here at uh, the Disneyland Resort. Pretty exciting time for us to be here. And uh, I just want to mention as well, of course, it's the 60th anniversary of Disney this year, which is, again, very exciting and great that we're here to celebrate that. And, Ryan, what about over at Universal? I know you spent some time in Harry Potter. Sure, sure. I was just here for research purposes. I want to be clear about that. <laughs> yes, be cool. we believe you. <laughs> Don't be fooled by that image. Uh, the picture is, is similar at Universal. Uh, the revenues at the theme parks business segment were up 17% last year and operating income was up nearly as much as well. So tremendous strong performance by the two large operators. This is due again to a combination of increased per capita spending as well as higher attendance. Uh, the performance was of course driven by the major openings at Universal Orlando Resort. Uh, you're gonna hear a tremendous amount about those uh, later today at other summit sessions and tomorrow and then of course at the SSEA uh, on Saturday evening. Um, so again, very, very good. Exactly. <laughs> um, what about the future for Universal? Universal is also investing heavily on the resort side, as you can see from uh, some of the uh, coming up here, our uh, major recent resort opening, uh, Cabana Bay, and there's another major opening that's going to occur uh, soon in Orlando as well. And uh, Universal is not only investing in Orlando, but they're also investing here uh, in, in Los Angeles, uh, including the soon to open uh, Fast and Furious portion of uh, the Universal. All the other operators, how they share this year, and what are we seeing in the Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, performance is a little bit more mixed uh, when we when we drop down a little bit in terms of the, the, the size. Um, over at SeaWorld, there were definitely some challenges in 2014, uh, and those had some notable impact on both attendance and financial performance. Uh, that said, the last quarter of 2014, uh, uh, the performance was much better, both in terms of attendance uh, and in terms of uh, revenue. Um, so hopefully uh, things will uh, begin to look a little better this year. They have a lot planned, a lot in the pipeline. The biggest part of this is the $100 million Blue World project, uh, which is uh, going to provide a new killer whale environment um, and uh, will enable a much closer depth interaction with the whale. Um, that's still just to open the first piece of that uh, in 2016. Um, in the nearer term, the new attraction, there are some new attractions opening this year. Um, sea World San Antonio is, is going to have a, a, a new Discovery Cove uh, style experience. And uh, Bush Gardens Williamsburg reportedly has a, has a new one. What about over at Six Flags? Yeah, Six Flags performance was up and down. Um, total revenues were up almost 6%, uh, driven by strong increase in per capita spending, uh, but this was unfortunately partially offset by a modest decline in attendance. Um, as you can see here, Six Flags opened quite a few major rides in 2014 including the Zimanjaro drop of doom, uh, which I have to say actually looks terrifying. <laughs> um, and Six Flags has a lot of additional new attractions uh, in opening up this year. It'll be interesting to see how these impact both their attendance and financial Are we going to see a picture of you on that next year? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll make that commitment now. I will get there. <laughs> uh, similarly, at Cedar Fair's performance was also mixed. Uh, revenues also increased uh, uh, modestly, driven likewise by an increase in per capita, but this was uh, unfortunately offset by a modest decline in attendance. Um, among others, Cedar Fair opened up uh, Banshee at Kings Island in 2014. They also have a number of major rides uh, in the pipeline opening this year. And uh, they also have a phased opening of the new renovated portions of the classic hotel breakers at Cedar Fair. Finally, um, over at Merlin, uh, they reported that its North American profits before tax were up nearly 11%, so strong performance there. Uh, driving this increase was continued rapid expansion in the U.S. They opened four new attractions last year, and uh, this year, um, in the near future, we're going to see the opening of the Orlando Eye and two other on-site attractions, a uh, major addition to the Orlando market. And Merlin's investing in that market further. Uh, the Legoland uh, Hotel will be opening in Florida very soon. What can you 
tell us about water parks? What's happening in that industry? You know, you, you really follow that industry in particular. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the U.S., activity is definitely intensifying. Um, and I, I think both on the theme park side as well as on the water park side, we're seeing, as John alluded to earlier, is the investment that's happening uh, on the West Coast and the area that's going to change uh, at some of the existing parks. And we're also seeing some new additions. Uh, this year we saw the new Hurricane Harbor. It opened at Six Flags over Georgia. Uh, we also saw some park rebranding uh, in addition to the new rides. Uh, a few examples of which you hear. And um, there's an awful lot of activity planned in 2015 as well for some of those additions. I also want to note uh, that the action is occurring not just at the outdoor water park. Uh, we have some major additions happening in the indoor water park industry as well. Great Wolf opened a new, uh, their first new indoor water park at the hotel uh, in uh, four or five years up in New England. And then we have two new indoor water parks coming online uh, literally minutes from each other in the Coconut Mountains near New York City. Major additions in that space as well. Just before leaving water parks, I want to note that um, they're really the beginning of a change that we're going to see uh, happening in the themed index very strongly in 2015 about the growth of that market. Uh, we saw in last year's themed index that Chimilong Water Park uh, took first position in the worldwide listing of water parks, uh, taking position in um, I think we can expect to see an awful lot of that occurring, uh, particularly starting on the water park side, and then we'll, uh, eventually we'll see carryover into the uh, indoor water park side as well. And speaking of international attractions, what about Latin America? You know, you were traveling down to Brazil quite a bit, and that made them start to a bit more. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I'd like to say uh, last year's big news uh, out of Latin America was, of course, Brazil's tragic 7-1 to loss to Germany in the semifinals of the World Cup. That was unexpected. <laughs> it was a very sad day for a lot of people. Uh, more seriously, though, as we begin to get into our preliminary results for the theme index, uh, interestingly, we have some conflicting reports across Latin America. Uh, some of the attractions are reporting that they, they had uh, decreased attendance because people were watching or going to Latin and just in summer, actually reporting increased attendance. So it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out when we get to our final numbers. Um, you know, even a little bit more seriously than that, there are some significant economic and political challenges in Latin America. I think driving a lot of this is the end of the worldwide uh, super cycle in, in commodities, essentially in things like, like copper and oil and the like. And that's been happening for some time. It's been uh, affecting uh, GDP growth and affecting investment in the region as well. And Certainly slow some of those returns that we've seen over the last couple of years. Uh, and that's likely continue for, for some time. By the way, Linda, I just want to point out that uh, you know, as an economist, I really, uh, I've really done my best to limit my uh, edition graphs and sort of like to only Thank chew you. on this slide. <laughs> I hope you're very good job. I think you're a new breed of economists. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it sounds like it's all doom and gloom for Latin America. Are there any bright spots? Yeah, fortunately, there are some bright spots. Um, uh, across the region, we saw the opening, uh, for example, of the new aquarium in Mexico City. Uh, Grupo Red opened a major new attraction in the Cancun area. They're going to be opening another new one this year as well. And uh, Kid Saini Sao Paulo just opened as well, and it's going to be rolling out across the region further. Um, so uh, we definitely have some, some bright spots. I have to report that my favorite new uh, ride and uh, or new attraction in the region was the Seal Medusa at Six Flags. Um, in many ways, it's like the Latin American economy. It's a little bit scary, but it's also a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Well, Linda, thanks, Brian. That was great. Uh, Linda, is special, you specialize in the museum sector. And I thought uh, we do have a little bit of time left here. So before we close up, um, you want to make any comments about what's happening in the museum sector oh, and anything I we found out from it? I'd love to. Just as a reminder, we added museums about two years into our third year. Third year yeah. um, having museums as part of the index, and we've gotten a you know, very positive response to that. Um, you know, from what Brian was saying, there's overall been you know, just tremendous growth in the theme park industry around the world. Um, the museum sector is a little bit of a different beast. Um, and museums really, you know, they're it's a very fragmented industry. There's not sort of these super operators. Um, and so uh, their attendance tends to be a little bit more random, frankly. Um, let's start with North America. Great. <laughs> um, on average, you know, we've seen museum attendance sort of on average very stable. Um, however, that does include sort of ups and downs as great as minus 18% for certain institutions and sort of an increase of, you know, 15% for others, even within North America. Um, but 
we're not really seeing you know trends. So the institution that was down by ten uh, percent last year may be up by ten percent this year. Um, so what we're seeing is that the variation is due to things like blockbuster exhibitions or temporary exhibitions that tend to be very popular. Um, you know, major events that drive tourism into the cities, and or even external weather. You know, things like the polar vortex in Chicago, um, which resulted in a lot of the museums in Chicago not doing as well as they sort of hoped. Um, some of them were saved by sort of blockbuster exhibitions, however. You know, the leader um, continues to be the, the National Natural History Museum um, in D.C. with over 7 million visits. Um, and I think this is a really important fact to bring up because this is despite the fact that they actually closed their core permanent exhibit, the dinosaurs. You know, dinosaurs are sort of the bread and butter of natural history museums. It's the reason you go to a natural history museum. Um, and, you know, they're going to be closed for actually five years. They're closing that exhibition for five years, which we think is actually indicative of the trend that we're seeing. Um, you know, if you don't know too much about history museums in America, I'm not going <laughs> to provide it right now. But, you know, there were a lot of museums <laughs> developed in the turn of the century, and then there were a lot developed after World War II um, in the 50s. And then there were, you know, many developed in the 1970s as sort of a new interest in culture and trends. And, and, and what we're seeing is a lot of the facilities and the permanent core exhibits have really aged. And the combination of that, plus the rapid changes in technology and entertainment and what it means to be a museum, I think, you know, are, are leading to this sort of wave of reinvestment in um, not just sort of expansion, but really redoing kind of core permanent exhibits and really trying to rethink what is a dinosaur exhibit. Um, and I think, you know, this is this is really big. And we're also seeing for the first time, you know, in the past, I think there's always been the tension in museums about sort of is, you know, business side leading things or the research side leading things. The research side would prefer to kind of just cover everything up and have no one ever see it and, and keep it pristine. Um, the business side wants, you know, everything to be open and touchable and exciting and maybe not even, you know, maybe no collections. Um, but what we're seeing for the first time, I think, is sort of agreement among all sides that um, it's okay to look to other industries. So it's okay to look to the entertainment industry and the hospitality industry um, for ideas, particularly related to visitor experience. I mean, museums are really in a very difficult, challenging time right now as they struggle with the idea of what is a museum and how do we compete with the kid who's at home playing you know, on his Xbox or playing you know, the online <laughs> world of <laughs> Warcraft. Uh, <laughs> I'm hoping I, my son never does that. But, you know, I think they're really having a they're, they're very challenged right now. There, a lot of them are trying to do things like, well, we won't call ourselves a museum. We'll be a center or something. You know, we're going to rebrand or we're going to add technology, but then the technology breaks down and it's not usable one day and, you know, visitors don't come back. So I think, you know, we think that there's sort of a wave starting and we think that it's a very good time for the famed entertainment industry to be very active in museums. Um, the other thing we're seeing is, you know, a lot more integration with real estate. So, I think as government funding is drying up and you know, certainly the impact of the recession, which I think many of these things are hit very, very hard by, um, you know, we're seeing real estate sort of start to replace some of those endowments. And so we're having a lot of clients who are looking at trying to finance both the development and operations of museums and cultural facilities with real estate. So things like let's build a luxury residential tower. Um, and have you know, the proceeds from that help finance sort of the construction of the museum and let put some money from that um, into an endowment that will help support the operations. So I think that's a very interesting trend. Um, you know, and I have to mention some of the things that are opening because I think we've seen a lot of things that have been in planning for a very long time that are finally, you know, have opened up and are opening up. In Atlanta, you know, a lot of happening in Atlanta, the National Center for Civil and Human Rights and the College Football Hall of Fame for Stanford. Um, <laughs> the Harvard Art Museum, which is a consolidation of three different museums in the Renzo Piano building, and it's certainly the major, you know, 130,000 square foot expansion of the Denver Museum of Science. Um, and then opening in just a little bit over a month is the, the new Whitney Museum of American Art. Really, I mean, moving from just sort of a, a gallery for the biennial to a major museum campus in the Meatpacking District. It's very, very big move away from their kind of core traditional um, supporters and, and donors. Um, you know, next year definitely to be watching the National Museum of African American History and Culture opening up, um, you know, major institution and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, which will reopen um, this brand new building. But these are all major facilities, and I think they're going to have an impact on the cultural landscape. So we're certainly going to be watching. What's that about? What's going on? 
going on in North America? What about uh, Europe? You know, Europe has been very stable. It's again, you know, what, what it shares in common with North America is that it's, uh, you know, very much a tendency, it's a mature market. So it's very much driven, a tendency driven by blockbuster and currently and those sorts of things. You know, what is different, and I think very interesting in Europe, is that um, unlike North America, there's no correlation between attendance and whether or not the museum is free or paid. Um, so whereas, you know, in North America, we see all the Smithsonian institutions at the top of the museum index, museum index every year. You know, in Europe, it's, it's not the case. Um, so that's, that's what's interesting. Now, we hear all these rumors in Asia about them building, you know, a, a thousand, a thousand museums. museums in two weeks or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> what's, uh, what's the scoop in Asia? Well, you know, this is preview addressing index. Um, we are estimating uh, growth and attendance at museums in Asia, which has been kind of interesting, um, which is tremendous. Um, it is really that is. mostly from new museums coming on board or from existing ones expanding? It, it's from both, but both. certainly new museums mm -hmm. um, and expansions and you know, expansions in quality um, and just certainly you know, the involvement in the class and some of the factors that Chris talked about. I think some interesting trends to watch is that there have been you know, quite a few, uh, a lot of talk, I think we talked about last year, about private museums, large, high quality, kind of museums you would see here, so the private museums um, opening, particularly in Shanghai, but other regions as well. Um, so things like the Hughes Museum and the Long Museum in the West Island in, in Shanghai. You know, there are some new government policy changes that are going to require private museums to actually um, adhere to standards for government-run museums, and we think that may, and, you know, unfortunately, than with these private museums. Um, you know, there are still government plans, you know, for exponential growth in museums. Um, that's not new. What, what is interesting, and similar to what Chris talked about with children, that the government is very specifically um, encouraging the development of children's museums. And so they want, what was the number? 120, they, 120 children's museums to be developed um, over the next 10 years. And, you know, we've talked to a lot of people, perhaps even here, who um, have you know been actively involved in this, and they certainly are reaching out to the global community um, for assistance with design, exhibits, visitor experience, even operations. Um, so I think children's museums will be a key focus. Um, you know, and there's been so many openings, as Chris said, it's it's really hard to track them. Um, and you know, some of them they open in these, these great buildings; they don't have much inside them. But you know, we are what we are seeing is a few announcements um, for large new institutions. These are just things, the scale is just is, is phenomenal. Um, but a better part of cultural districts. So the first time we're starting to see these cultural districts develop, similar to the many, many of them here. Um, you know, the Taipei City Museum of Art, about a 500,000 square foot facility, um, is going to be completed by 2019. It's going to include both a museum of contemporary art and a children's art museum and a multifunctional performance space. Um, the National Art Museum of China, um, 13 hectare space. Part of the new cultural district expected to attract you know, around 12 million visitors a year, um, and then you know our, our old favorite, the West Helen Cultural District. Which how many people here have worked on that um, at some point in their careers? Uh, the M Plus Museum, which is a museum of visual culture, um, and a lot of people actually in Hong Kong and China when they were polling had no idea what visual culture was. Um, but they are opening this brand new museum. Again, it's about 600,000 square feet. Um, it features for sort of contemporary art in Hong Kong that's um, just broke ground and is scheduled to be open in 2019. So there really is quite a bit of talking in Asia. You know, we have a few extra minutes that they gave us here this morning. I, I had one other question that says we've been noticing that the large museum brands like the Smithsonian, National Geographic, um, even other content. Uh, Owners like BBC, they're they're looking at how can we take our brand and our content and, and move it out beyond our core institutions. Do you, do you have any thoughts about that and where that might go? Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, these are um, friends. Here, so. <laughs> we, <laughs> we do. I mean, we have seen that, and certainly we've seen a lot of people talk about trying to open up new facilities. Um, you know, for example, uh, the American Museum of Natural History opened their, their facility in Perry Fire, right, um, Kansas City, mm -hmm. uh, as part of a retail entertainment complex. And a very interesting model, I think, and it's doing very, very well. The memberships have actually far surpassed what they expected. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, 
we, we have seen all the other sort of major institutions looking at having other facilities, secondary facilities, um, but we haven't seen a lot of commitment to investment quite yet. But that might be something so in the future that our audience could look forward to these big brands and museums rolling out over around the world and around the U.S. And it is possible that just you know there will be some consolidation of the museum industry. I think a lot of the funders of museums um, often say you know they don't like to have to give so much money to all these small little institutions, particularly for the small and medium sized um, museums. And, and they are very much encouraging museums to collaborate and when they can to actually co-locate um, and merge. Well, reporting live from Disneyland in California, this is John Robinette. And Linda, too. And, and this, this is, is World, World Attraction, Attraction News. News.